Yeah, I want to uh, start really by, I think, outlining why it's worth looking back at the lessons of the minority movement, which was the Communist Party's key industrial initiative throughout the 1920s. Um, and I wanted to do that really by starting to draw out some of the parallels with the period that we're in really at the moment um, to that period, um, but also you know, pointing to a few differences, I think, that, that, that exist as well. Um, I think both then and now the situation that revolutionaries find themselves confronted with is marked by you know, low levels of confidence among workers uh, to organise independently the trade union leadership and you know, a, a lack really of rank and file movement in any, in any way to, to drive on official action when the union leaders move to sell out the struggle. And I think both then and now as well, the existence of a, of a left section of the trade union bureaucracy who, uh, despite what we, what we know about the pressures acting on them to hold them back, which will be explored more in a meeting um, that's on tomorrow morning, um, we do, you, know, you can say that there's a, there's a section of the left bureaucracy who want to see workers' resistance on a national scale. Um, I think there's also some notable differences which I think are worth starting the meeting with. Um, you know, as I'll go on to look at, the minority movement uh, was launched at a time when demoralisation was widespread as a result of a, of a quite recent sellout and defeat of a, of a powerful, um, largely unofficial strike movement that spanned a decade from the great unrest uh, right up to 1920. And while today I think you, know, you look at the situation where we've got the, the, the Thatcher's legacy, the corpse of the miners' strike, um, years of anti-trade union laws and not much struggle. All this does hang over the, the you know, workers' confidence today. It's not actually the case, I think, that the overall mood is one that's dominated by demoralisation. Um, rather than being battered from a, from a very recent defeat of absolutely huge proportions as workers were in the early 1920s, it's more the case that I think now workers haven't really had the chance to get out the door enough to, to, for, for confidence in the struggle to be able to develop. Um, so the mistakes of the 1920s left the working class in a, in a weak position to take on the brutal attacks that were going to come in the, in the next decades as a result of the Depression uh, in the 1930s. Um, and the, the 1920s really, I think, began with a flipping back um, in, the, in the direction of the bosses of the initiative. Um, so you saw the attempts to impose absolutely major attacks on wages. Um, but the period of the minority movement was not yet one quite where we're seeing the, the absolutely um, mass scale of the, the attacks that we face today. I think today the Tories and the bosses are coming for everybody all at once with savage austerity that doesn't just mean that you know, workers are, are seeing attacks on their wages all at once, but actually reaches right down into the, you know, the welfare state it's completely from every angle people are under siege. Um, so in a way the situation that we're in today is, is slightly different in these two ways. Um, it's the lack of rank and file confidence, I think, an organisation rather than demoralisation that dominates um, the mood among workers that we see at the moment. Um, and also I think the argument for unity um, around the, gen the idea of a general strike takes place in a slightly con different context as well, because rather than just being about rallying around one group of workers that's under attack at that point, you know, everybody's under attack at the moment. Um, so I just wanted to start with that, but I think that you know, obviously the, the lessons of the minority movement are, are, are quite important for us because of the similarities that we do see in the, in the two periods. Um, so I wanted to start really, um, you know, the, the defeat of the 1926 general strike really um, is something that we can, you know, draw out quite key lessons that are quite devastating lessons as well. Um, but really the, the defeat of the 1926 general strike signalled the ultimate failure um, in the minority, of the mi minority movement and its main objective, which was really to try and strike the balance necessary um, in working with and against the left union leaders in order to aid the development of, you know, uh, you know, a situation where rank and, where rank and file movements can be nurtured. And the question for this meeting really, I think, is uh, why did it fail in this objective? And I want to argue really that it's not because the initiative, um, you know, fundamentally didn't fit the period, that it was, that it was flawed um, in, in its conception, but actually for, instead for two reasons. Um, firstly, I think it failed because the Communist Party um, didn't get the balance right in working with against the, the trade union bureaucracy. In practice, actually, um, you know, they were clearly incredibly naive about the left union leaders, uh, which in some senses is actually quite unbelievable to the extent they were shocked by the sellouts from the left, uh, given that they'd had kind of what happened in um, 1921, which we'll go on to look at. Um, but I think this is also a reflection of the genuine difficulty in working with and against union officials um, in the struggle. Um, and the second reason really intensified the first, um, and that was the Stalinist politics coming from, from Russia that placed the kind of greatest importance on you know, the impact that any sharper criticism of the left officials would have in their support for Russia. Um, but despite this ultimate failure, the minority movement had some, some very important successes, it had widespread support that meant it had a huge potential. Um, and I think with a less politically confused Communist Party at its leadership, you know, things could have, um, you know, could, could have been different lessons that would be drawn from it. Um, so I wanted to sort of talk really about the context in which 
the minority movement was launched because that's all absolutely critical really to understanding it as a um, you know as an initiative. Um, so I wanted to start in 1919 um, when you had a 40 hour strike which started in Glasgow in opposition to the trade union leaders, in opposition to the TUC um, and this, uh, this strike was smashed when the government sent troops in from the north of England. They had to send them in from the north of England because they couldn't send them from from Glasgow because the troops were refusing to go and to go and break up the strikes there. Um, but you know this was this was a you know they smashed the movement really on what became known as Bloody Friday. And I think it's important to say really that that strike wasn't just purely an economic strike about a forty hour week. It was about really the movement, um, you know, powerful sort of students movement that that had um, built up over the, over that decade. It was about this movement guarding against the anticipated attacks that were going to come at the end of the war um, to guard against the rise in unemployment to protect. The gains that had been won through those previous years, um, you know, by keeping more work, um, making sure that everybody could 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 stay in work rather than concentrating the jobs that were there in, in, in the hands of a few um, people. So it was actually a very political strike, um, that strike. And this movement also contained a revolutionary potential, I think, because you know it took place in the context where you had the police on strike, you had uh, soldiers mutinying across the across the country. Um, but actually, this movement was defeated due to its relative isolation. Um, and you know, partly this was due to the kind of syndicalism of the Great Unrest Movement meant that there was no move really to try and generalise um, seriously across the country in that way. Um, and I think had the Communist Party been launched uh, in the rise of those struggles in 1918, not only could it, you know, would it have um, been shaped and strengthened politically itself by the experience of those struggles, um, but it could have actually in turn fundamentally you know, shaped and directed the 1919 strikes. Um, it could have provided a centralised leadership um, that would have been able to organise solidarity and prevent the isolation of that strike, I think, or at least work towards it. Um, so then you had the failure on the part of the TUC to lead a strike threatened by a million miners, and this was really fundamental as well to tipping that balance back in the power of the bosses, di- uh, back in the direction of the, of the bosses, really. Um, in 1919, the miners had called for a wage increase and nationalisation of the industry and threatened an indefinite national strike. And you know the government at that point, uh, led by Lloyd George, did really what any sensible and crafty government would have done in that situation. Um, you know where you've got a near revolutionary atmosphere and post-war coal shortage and so on, and it, it backtracked and it appointed a commission, um, basically postponing the um, the attack until the balance of forces was more really in the in the boss's favour, I think, um, and the strike action was as a result suspended. Um, and I think none of us will be um, surprised really to to hear that the government despite pledging to implement the Commission's recommendation for nationalisation, simply waited waited until, um, uh, as it was put at the time, the danger point for capitalism had passed. Um, so in autumn of 1920, you had a, you know, a two-week national strike uh, that gained a temporary wage increase, but then in April 1921, the post-war slump, the coal stock stocking up high, employers decided that this was the point that we were going to impose a national lockout to enforce the wage cuts. And on Black Friday, um, there's a lot of dodgy Fridays about in this period, uh, the leaders of the two unions of the Triple Alliance, um, sorry, the other two unions in the Triple Alliance, which was an alliance between the railway union, the transport union, and the miners, which was um, formed really supposedly to, to boost the strength um, you know, within, within the movement and to strengthen the unions. Uh, these these two, the union leaders of these two unions uh, pulled out of their, their, their promised sympathy strike and abandoned the miners. And you know, one of the reasons why I think it is quite astonishing really to see the mistakes that the Communist Party go on to make throughout this period is that um, this was effectively, uh, Duncan Hallis used the term a preview of the 1926 general strike. This was you know, essentially the same process that happened, so really they'd had plenty of warning. Um, then you had engineering, which had been the spine, of, you know, spine running through wartime shop stewards organisation. This was broken too after a four-month national lockout in 1922. And so you had, you know, the context really, you've got workplace organisation collapsing, you've got, you know, a, a shift really um, to workers becoming more reliant on the bureaucracy um, in, in, in this period. And this was the context that the Communist Party was launched then, and, you know, between 1920 and 1921, by which point, you know, you moved on really from the, from the period of the previous decade. Unemployment had risen dramatically, um, and employers really in Britain were, were clawing back what the struggle had won over that past decade. Um, and as an indication of this retreat, really, um, just, just as an example, trade union membership dropped by over 2 million uh, between 1920 and 1923, which is, uh, you know, just under a third. Uh, which is massive. Um, and then, you know, the, the leading uh, British communist, JT Murphy, touched upon the, the difficulties really that this new, brand new communist party faced in trying to build a rank and file movement. Um, and he said, you know, we have a powerful shop stewards movement, but it can only exist in objective conditions. How can you build factory organisations and empty and depleted workshops? 
And so throughout the 1920s, really what the Communist Party strategy was about, it was defined by this dis disintegration of the workplace organisation in the context of a retreat in the unions, uh, sorry, a retreat away from the unions um, on the part of you know, workers. The minority movement was a method um, really to work with those looking to rebuild the union strength and that included uh, left officials and it was with the aim of trying to work towards a situation where you could kind of prod rank and file organisation into being. Um, and the, the national minority movement in 1924 pulled off a conference with 270 delegates, um, but these delegates represented 200,000 uh, workers because there was an emphasis on not just signing up as individual members, but as you know, getting your your back and from 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 your union branch and your uh, workplace and so on. And I think um, you know the aim was was outlined clearly. Um, it said the minority movement itself is not a trade union. It consists of militant members of existing trade unions who aim to. Um, whose aim is really to make the trade unions into real militant organs of class struggle. And so, to give a bit of an indication of the shape of the minority movement, you had the, the engineering union president, Tom Mann, who had been one of the leaders of the new unionism. He became the president of the minority movement, um, and he, you know, he had roots in the, the you know, struggles and how to form and build unions, how to transform them. And he was very well known among the, the bosses of the time as uh, you know, a, a serious militant. You also had AJ Cook, who was a South Wales miner, Another talented organiser who'd been involved in the minority movement, um, and he'd actually come up through the um, process being influenced by a, a pamphlet that, um, that came out in 1912, which was really about saying that you know workers had to um, you know you know workers had to, to, to challenge the union leaders and be prepared to organise to go beyond them and so on if they weren't going to lead. Um, and he was the you know when he became the um, the miners' leader in uh, 1924. He was denounced as a raving communist, but he actually wasn't a member of the Communist Party. Um, and there was a number of other you know, influential left union leaders who worked with the minority movement who were not members of the Communist Party. Um, so by, by 1926, the minority movement had bodies affiliated to it that represented 957,000 workers. Um, and you know, they'd had a, a series of successes in getting you know, some real left militants selected into union positions. Um, and it was you know, hugely significant in terms of working within the unions to rebuild organisation and confidence and the Communist Party were the driving force behind the minor minority movement, um, despite the fact that it had such broad support from left union leaders and you know, nearly a million rank and file workers in, in, in some way connected to it. Um, now the, at that, from the beginning really, um, at the beginning really, rather than from the beginning, the objective was outla outlined quite clearly, I think, by the Communist Party, where they, you know, the argument was put in 1924 by leading communists that the minority movement's main focus should not actually be on the left officials, but on building uh, among rank and file workers. Um, and they had a series of uh, uh, back to the union, stop the retreat themed conferences that were organised throughout 1922. You had over 300 at the London one, um, and you had a number of successful regional ones and so on across the country. And you know these were spaces where people were fighting to kind of put, um, you know, industry specific demands to build around uh, tasking activists with you know how to go out and organise and rebuild the unions on the shop floor. Um, you know, looking back to the kind of um, powerful factory committees that existed in the wartime shop stewards movement. And the name the minority movement came about actually um, from, from an attack on the, from the right wing, really, that you know, denounced these activists as uh, you know, a minority of troublemakers. So this is where the name really came from. And that was the kind of reputation that the minority movement had. Um, and its effect on you know, things like wage negotiations were clear. You look at the, the mines, they had a campaign um, against the union leadership's acceptance of an offer in engineering. They had um, you know, the claim around the one pound a week. And in the railways, uh, they had a battle for a minimum wage of three pound. 10 and a 42 hour a week and so on. So they were you know, involved in, in fighting um, and said these um, militant struggles within the unions throughout that period. The idea really being that you know, developing, connecting up um, you know, th these issues and building solidarity, taking initiatives um, at a rank and file level that could pull workers in to some kind of network. Um, and really you know, the idea from, from the beginning was supposed to be that this would be um, helping to build up for the moment when the betrayal comes from the union leaders, that you'd have some kind of network on the ground that was um, prepared for that. But one of the slogans, I think, heralded by the minority movement was, uh, was more difficult in this respect, was, was, was more of a problem um, and actually highlighted, I think, the muddied vision about how the movement um, would actually achieve what it was trying to achieve. And that was the call for uh, all power to the General Council in the build-up to the 1926 general strike. Um, you know, the lessons from the 1921 Black Friday sellout had not been the, quite the same, really, for everybody. Um, you know, for uh, some of the communists that highlighted the need really to rebuild rank and file organisation to overcome the bureaucracy um, and so on. But it had also been widely understood, I think, that the problem had been that there wasn't some kind of clear, uh, you know, command from the from the top of the movement. And actually, what you needed was some some kind of you know unifying 
uh, you know, responsibility at the top of the movement that was able to direct, and that was why it had, it had all gone wrong, really, in 1921. Um, and this really, I think, revealed the kind of illusions, really, within the minority movement leadership about the nature of the trade union bureaucracy and the kind of naivety that did exist there. Um, so in the summer of 1925, the mine bosses moved into attack, uh, and the Miners' Federation calls on the TUC for support. Um, and you know they respond with saying that there would be a total embargo on coal um, if this attack was to go ahead. And what you see then is uh, you know similar to what you've seen uh, a few years previously, where you know the government backs down and announces a nine-month subsidy for the coal owners, and another commission is set up. And you just think, right, okay, this is the point where you know it should be clear, really, <laughs> that this is a, a rerun of events that the issue has not gone away, that it's going to come back, um, and that it's another delay tactic, and it should have been obvious really to the to the, you know, these left union leaders that had such a history of um, in the struggle, um, that what that um, meant was that they should be uh, using this time to you know, build up, you know, get ready the troops, gather arsenal, prepare the ground for the big standoff that was coming as soon as this commission reports back. Um, it certainly should have been clear to the Communist Party that that's what, um, that's what they should be doing. Um, you know, the bosses and the government knew that this was what they had to do. You look at their preparations, they um, put in charge of their preparations a guy called Sir John Anderson, who had the experience of the Civil War in Ireland um, and instructed the organisation in maintenance supplies, uh, you know, divided the country into districts, each with a commissioner for their own apparatus and a chain of command and so on. Um, and this was uh, you know, how, the, how the ruling class was getting prepared for this standoff. Um, but you know, also what I think a significant thing really about what the, how the ruling class saw their preparations at that point was that they didn't want to break the strike in 1926 through an ultimate standoff. They wanted to, um, you know, they wanted to use the trade union leaders to break the back of the union movement and try and repeat what had happened in the early 20s. Um, and I think despite the Communist Party's initial clarity about the dangers toward against and working, uh, you know, alongside the left union leaders, they actually failed to carry through this strategy at the point that it was, you know, most important. Um, you know, no proper preparations of the sort have been made by the TUC or even the left union leaders for the showdown. And at this point, really, exactly when the Communist Party should have been politically pre preparing the rank and file workers for any sellout, um, you know, putting through an argument about, about um, making sure that they were prepared uh, to carry that through, the focus shifted to all power for the General Council, which is a complete steer away from the idea that we should be doing pre preparatory work on the ground to organise the rank and file to get ready to provide independent leadership or at least attempt to get yourself to a position where you're, where you're raising these arguments among sections of militants. Um, and, you know, the Communist Party leadership really fudged the question repeatedly over the left officials, naively mistaken what was a kind of left rhetoric um, on the question of Russia and the Russian Revolution for an assurance that they were going to actually follow through in the struggle on the ground. Um, and, you know, they didn't, it's not like they had no warning about this. In, in January 1926, uh, Trotsky wrote, uh, in the British Labour movement, international questions have always been the line of least resistance to the union leaders. Regarding international matters as a kind of safety valve for the radical moods of the masses, these esteemed leaders are prepared to a certain extent to bow to a revolution, as long as it's elsewhere, uh, so that they can still take revenge on questions of the internal class struggle. The left faction of the General Council is distinguished by its complete ideological shapelessness and uh, therefore incapable of organisationally assuming the leadership of the trade union movement. And Duncan Hallis kind of summed up the, the, the absolute catastrophe of what the Communist Party's error was quite well when he said, and so the right wing prepared the sellout, the left provided camouflage for the right, and the Communist Party and the minority movement helped to preserve the credibility of the lefts. And the 1926 defeat was of hugely damaging significance, I think, for the working class movement, particularly for its ability to defend you know, against what was to come after the Wall Street crash. Um, so you had the miners sold out and left to fight alone, uh, you know, smashed and forced to accept these huge attacks. Uh, and the defeat was more of a blow to the working class, really, that, um, then, I think, than you know, the miners' strike in the 1980s defeat was, because it was a much, a much bigger percentage um, of the working class that miners made up. Um, and you had this compounded impact of demoralisation um, and so on. Um, so it was obviously a, hu a huge blunder. And when you kind of follow through the events, you wonder how it could have gone so wrong and, and what, you, what you can see, I think, from the birth of the Communist Party is this continuing theme of struggling to get the balance right between a kind of ultra-leftism um, and then being too soft on the officials. Um, and, you know, the first two years or so, the British Communist Party's existence saw an argument about what sort of party they should be building, um, you know, with the conference in 1922 having to make a turn really towards mass united work, particularly in the, in the trade unions. Um, you had the development of Stalinism's grip throughout the mid to late 1920s, um, you know, with the line coming from Russia and, you know, increasingly warped, really, 
But I think it's understandable that if you're going to be building a communist party in Britain right after you've seen you know, a Bolshevik revolution uh, that's uh, taking power in Russia, that it would make sense that you would look to Russia for this kind of lead on the question. Um, but I think the naivety towards the left officials, based to a large extent on their attitude towards Russia um, and their, their sort of political rhetoric and so on, um, was a mistake that was certainly exacerbated and encouraged by you know, the Stalinist political line. Um, and then you saw the zigzagging on this question that would develop um, and act to compound, really, in the next few years, damage done uh, you know, by the mistakes of the, the 1926 general strike. Um, you know, because what the experience in 1926 uh, did as well was it fundamentally shaped the way in which the trade union bureaucracy approached the vicious attacks of the 1930s. Um, you know, they were struck by this realisation that terrified them, really, that you know, somehow uh, this class struggle and its intensified height that it had reached in the 20s really you know, shook the whole kind of economic and political system to its core and threw up the question of, of seizure of power and what would happen if um, the government did back down, were the trade union leaders going to go on and run the country and so on. And I think that the, the revolutionary potential in such high-level strike movements was something that the trade union bureaucracy very much wanted to you know, step away from and, and not involve themselves with. So you had, throughout the 1930s, a reluctance to call national action, you know, a, a power sort of shifting to the, to the right wing of the bureaucracy, um, and a collaboration with employers that was about accepting attacks and changes that came with the progress in industry and so on. And you know, in that context, the CP actually did leave quite, lead quite impressive rank-and-file movements um, but this was despite a battle, you know, a continuing battle that, that followed on really from what happened in the 20s by a confused leadership that was at that point trying to interpret the new Stalinist line class against class. And initially they actually compounded the, the dive in the, their membership and, you know, uh, arguably in some places in the trade union movement by adopting a strategy of retreating from the unions at that point after this huge defeat um, and, and arguing, talk, uh, you know, organised separate red ones at that point. Um, which they then they then shifted to correct later in, in that decade, but the, you know so the period of the minority movement, I think the history um, of the British Communist Party throughout this period is one that's you know an incredibly frustrating uh, experience to follow through, but it's also rich with, with lessons that I think are are quite important for us. And I think it's important to say that despite the political weakness um, of this uh, young British Communist Party in the twenties, um, you know they actually didn't fail in, in one aspect of what they were trying to do, and that was the kind of you know the initiative. The, the kind of the talent, the way that they threw themselves in, self-sacrifice that was taken by members of an organisation really just over 5,000 strong was quite astonishing really and I think uh, an example really for any revolutionary organisation and um, you can you can take sort of an inspiration from that. Um, and the Communist Party, you know, for all the mistakes that they made, they weren't an irrelevant force. Uh, faced with difficult circumstances, they actually threw themselves fully into a strategy of trying to rebuild um, the strength of the unions and sought to nurture rank and file organisation. Um, and you go back to that, you know, <coughs> JT Murphy quote really, I think didn't actually have a huge amount of choice at the time, you know, when you look at the situation uh, that the working class was facing in the early 1920s, the, the, you know, the, the huge shift in the balance um, that, that had, had shifted back in terms of the bosses and the, the dips in the trade union movement and so on. Um, but, you know, they, they, they didn't just remark that the period wasn't a favourable one, we can't do anything. Um, you know, they got stuck in, but, you know, they got it, they got it fundamentally wrong. The, politi the political judgment was, was flawed, really, at the key moment. And I think, you know, had they got the balance right and politically prepared workers for the sellout, um, then it's not to say that it would have definitely all overturned and we would, you know, see a workers' revolution follow through um, at all. But they certainly would have left the, the, the Communist Party and the working class more, more broadly in better position for the battles to come. And I think, you know, history obviously doesn't repeat itself in the same way twice. And it goes without saying that there's a number of obvious differences with the period that we're in at the moment and the one, um, you know, the one in the 1920s. But I think for revolutionaries who find themselves in a situation as we do, where there's, you know, not sufficient confidence or organisation for rank and file movements to exist, and in which we need to look to work out how we can get from where we are at the moment to, to that kind of point, then the period of the minority movement is certainly one that I think is a is a useful place to start to look at to, to pull out some of those lessons. Yeah, I think uh, I think the, uh, the the period that we're we're talking about is um, is really vital in terms of uh, of, of socialists. Basically, the the biggest issue really. Um, that uh, the working class faces, and I, I think that there's a there's a problem that uh, uh, this isn't sort of stressed in the uh, in the party that uh, um, um, what the what the, the speaker correctly described 
about uh, how the uh, Communist Party operated and the uh, differences in the, uh, the political periods and that. But one of the biggest issues was that uh, um, we have to get a head round is about the, uh, the trade union bureaucracy are not <coughs> interested in revolution. The trade union bureaucracy has a stake in the, uh, the, the system. Uh, they don't want uh, revolution. Obviously, they don't want the workers crushed. But uh, um, if you read Cliff and uh, Gluckstein on 1926, the general general strike. Uh, he, they talk about how um, the trade union bureaucracy vacillate between supporting the workers, supporting the bosses, but ultimately they pick the side of the uh, of, of, of the bosses, which happened in uh, um, 19, 1926. And so, so why? Why then do we get um, strikes if uh, if the trade union bureaucracy are so uh, opposed? Well, in I think it was 1921. What, what was what was quoted about the uh, um, the Black Friday, where the uh, um, the workers were sold out with the with the triple triple alliance and that uh, the, the, the trade union bureaucracy were frightened of um, revolution uh, happening. So uh, the, the, the whole idea of uh, um, um, supporting the workers was not, it was not on the table. If there's a revolution, then the trade union bureaucracy are out of a job because it's then the workers are in the saddle. They, those are the ones that have control of society, whereas in the run-up to 1926, we had Red Friday, where the uh, the Triple Alliance did um, say that they support the miners and that they go out on strike together uh, to to smash the uh, the government if the government didn't uh, did back down. And this this what this showed was that the trade union bureaucracy felt at the time that the movement was so weak that they could get away with um, taking a militant sounding su su stand. It, it, it was exactly the same thing at the end of the day, bureaucracy from, from above. We have, to rem rem we have to learn from this okay, and I'll we have to, we have to uh, uh, yeah, stop know that this is now. the uh, this is the most important thing that the, the leaders are not fighting. We have to fight. Thank you. I, I found that a very interesting introduction. If I make some points that might, I'm not really disagreeing, I want to ask some questions about the background. Um, I think one of the problems we've got is that the difference between, in the both ideologically and organisationally, the left or the reformist movement of the trade unions are not at all, I think at the moment, in the same situation as they were in the early 1920s or the mid 1920s. For example, I, I don't know if any of you here were, were actually participants in trade union activity at the last high point of trade union activity in this country. And if you, if you were, and you compare, I mean, the branch I was in, an ordinary white collar shark county now branch, as an annual general meeting decided, we're not having any full time officials in here except with the permission of the branch. We're going to do things on our own. And that, we, won, we won that fight politically, and it was quite successful. Now, they say to the um, uh, full time officials, oh, have you got time to do a disciplinary for us? You know, I mean, there's a qualitatively different thing. Second thing is, the leaders of the Communist Party and many trade union activists in the early 20s <coughs> were the same people who had been part of the great unrest and the precursors of the Communist Party before the First World War. They had, we heard earlier today, some of us, about the syndicalist network of ideas that had gone round about mistrusting full-time officials. I think there were, I think, if I remember correctly, 
the engineers dur during the First World War sent missionaries to other cities to build support for their resistance to the government and to, to the employers. Now, I think that's a very, very different position. And I, for example, there is one good thing about the weakness of reformism. They're so weak, their ideas won't stand in the way of a genuine <coughs> class upsurge. If there is a class upsurge, there's much less of a struggle against reformism. To be I think that so I would like, I, the question I want answered, thought about, is there are a large number of differences between the 10s and the 20s and the 70s and today, those two comparisons. And the question is, is there enough <coughs> historical remembrance apart from the party that will make for a new minority movement and a class upsurge? Yeah, it's probably an oversimplification, um, but uh, when I think about the minority movement, the CP in the 1920s, um, ultimately it failed in terms of uh, establishing and sustaining that kind of network of activists across the, um, the trade unions. And what it did very quickly, the CP, was it morphed into a strategy um, for getting left-wing <coughs> officials elected. And a strategy, actually, that they pursued uh, for many, many years. And it's already been said, evidence that that strategy <coughs> failed and was misplaced and naive was 1926 and uh, the general strike, that uh, absurd slogan, all power to the TUC General Council, which promptly sold out uh, the, the general strike. And I guess in some ways it's not directly analogous, but a modern day parallel is what happened after November the 30th, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where very quickly, you know, after a magnificent display of uh, uh, strike action over two and a half million workers, some union leaders you know, couldn't wait to, to sell the, the whole thing out. And therefore, the challenge for us is to establish a kind of network uh, of activists across the trade union or labour movement that can try and make that uh, much more difficult for them to sell out. And that's why something like the United Resistance is so important. Uh, I'm an EIS, EIS activist, and that's the largest um, teacher trade union in Scotland. Very significant in Scottish terms. We, we've got over 8% of teachers in Scotland. And we've just affiliated to United Resistance in, in June of this year. Um, and it's hugely important because one of the problems at the moment is that workers don't have the confidence to actually act independently of the union bureaucracy. But you know, um, Connors, one of the things that's actually disturbing me slightly is the number of people that I think are just too pessimistic about the situation that we're in at the moment. It's all gloom and doom. And one of the things I would say to you, I actually do think there is still anger there. I don't think it's demoralisation. I don't think people are going to walk out at the drop of a hat. But what I do think is there's a willingness amongst across a whole number of trade unions, a willingness uh, for workers to actually fight back. The ballot results across the different trade unions illustrate that. We've had yet another ballot in our union, the EIS, in relation to the pensions dispute. We were trying to get a kind of Scottish type um, solution where we've got a 91% yes vote uh, for strike action. And those kind of ballot results are mirrored across the trade union movement. Um, so what I'd urge everyone to do is, I think United Resistance is not a panacea. We're at an early stage with it, but I think it's hugely important that we try to build it across the trade union movement. Um, you've all probably seen the leaflet. Take it into your workplace. Look at the model motion. Probably not the finest example, a 9,000 word motion on, on the second page. But it does give you the opportunity to raise at all levels within the union and urge affiliation to it. Um, I think, as I say, it does offer us offer the best hope in the circumstances we're in at the moment. Thanks. I'd like to thank you for being on time and being for fun as well, so thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, just picking up on that point about uh, acting independently, see, I think quite often we look back at what the Clyde Workers Committee did and thought, Jesus, I can't do that, I can't act independently. But actually, there are things people can do, and I think the art of trying to build is looking at what you can do rather than just looking at the gap to what you wish you could do. And I think people can act independently, if act independently means have a meeting with a few workmates and discuss what you want to do, take a little collection for solidarity, you know, send a message of support, you know, do whatever little things about issues in your own workplace you can do. And actually the, the process of doing that is how we build up the capacity to act independently over the much bigger actions and you know, hopefully 
at some point the strike action. And I think that's extremely important if we're talking about trying to build up the rank and file. And I think. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so the, um, the important thing for me is about how, uh, as socialists, we can work with elements of the bureaucracy to try and strengthen the rank and file without falling into the trap that the Communist Party did in the 1920s of ending up dropping the bits that were about politically and organisationally preparing the rank and file for the time when the bureaucracy sell out. Because when the comrade spoke before, he was right to say the bureaucracy in the final analysis sell out and in the meantime they vacillate. But that vacillation is very, very important. It opens up space for us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise have. But I think there are a couple of things we need. Well, one is incredible political clarity. And the Communist Party had many militants who had been through that experience of the Great Unrest, and yet they still got in that tremendous muddle and screwed it up. And we have the privilege of looking back at their mistakes to try and avoid doing the same again. But in a sense, that political clarity is even more important for us now. And the reason why, I think, is this, that when workers are in motion, they rub up against the union bureaucracy and they find out from, from their own experience their shortcomings and the difficulties and they start to question, well, why aren't you doing what we need you to do to win this fight? Actually, when there's a relatively low level of struggle, few people gain that by direct experience. And therefore, the politics in the situation of explaining what reformism is and the role of the union bureaucracy is even more important, I think, in terms of what we're trying to do than it will be at other times. Um, start with that um, question about uh, similarities and differences because I think there are some similarities between today and the 1920s. On the one hand, the, uh, the rank and file organisation uh, with you know, the shop shoesmen developed in the, you know, in the period before 1920 actually was, was a big decline. You know, the decline was all Black Friday, the defeats and unemployment. In the same way as we've seen, it's much more difficult. You know, the, the rank and file organisation which we saw in the 70s and which continued in bits towards the 80s and 90s, again, is weaker, is weaker and ruined. And on the other hand, there, there, there was, uh, there's been, you know, we've seen recently Lemon Cluskin for the growth of, uh, you know, left wing uh, speaking trade union leaders, and we had the situation in the 1920s. I think there's a difference, a different, big difference in scale. I mean, if you look at the, the, uh, the left, some of the speech of the left wing leaders in, 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 uh, in the 1920s, I mean, at the TC conference, for example, 1925, uh, Alonzo Swales, who was the head of the, AE, the engineers union, who was the president of the TC Congress, this was his presidential address. Um, we are entering upon a new stage of development in the upper struggle of our class. The new phase of development, which is worldwide, has entered upon the next and probably the last stage of revolt. It's the duty of all members of the working class to so, so, so to solidify their movements that come when the time may for the last final struggle, which we want in neither machinery nor men to move forward to the destruction of wage slavery and the construction of a new order of society based upon coordinated effort and work that the mutual goodwill and understanding. That was the president of the TUC to address the TUC Congress. Now, in that situation, you can understand, uh, combined with the pressure from uh, from, uh, from Stalin, the Anglo-Russian uh, 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 trade union committee, to actually have illusions in some of these trade union leaders. And that's important for us, because when people say, oh, listen to the speech of Lem McCluskey or someone else, they wouldn't sell us out. These were much better than the Lem McCluskeys, and they sold out because of the nature of the trade union bureaucracy itself. So there are similarities, and there are lessons from that. You know, and if you look at the, well, in many ways, what was the crucial period, because the Communist Party did many great things, to be honest. You know, any half-decent militant would have been in the Communist Party in the, in the early 1920s. They were the workplace militants. They didn't fall for either the, the uh, state and trade union struggle or previous uh, socialist organisations, or the ultra-leftism um, who today were called for puppet unions and then called for red unions, you know, they move out of the unions. No, they got involved in the organisations of the working class. They were right to actually uh, to, to link up with left union leaders to create space for organisation. The problem was, was that in 1925 we were Red Friday, when the ruling class backed off, everyone knew it was going to be a temporary back off. Actually, instead of saying, yes, you know, uh, the, the, the record is going to come, we need, but at the same time, those leaders, we can't trust them, you know, we'll be with them when they're moving was, we can't trust them, we need to build, try and rebuild that independent rank file organisation. Instead, they went the other way and with the all powers of the General Council slogan. So it's the lesson for us today in the UTR. Yes, we work, we work and we build with any of the, any of the left union leaders who will actually call action. At the same time, actually we try and develop that rank and file organisation, because even the best of them, because of the nature of the bureaucracy, will sell out on us.
ancient people who was around in the 1970s remembers it. And it's actually quite important because I think it's, you start from saying, when we talk about a rank and file movement, what do we actually mean? Because when we talk about it in the 1970s, it's a very simple, I mean, I'll, I'll paraphrase. The rank and file movement was bodies of workers and their local leadership, effectively, who could take action against the employers independent from the trade union bureaucracy. So we're talking about action and talking about independent trade union bureaucracy, and we're talking about mass movements. When the dockers were, when the, the dockers were jailed in 1972, the massive action which took them out of jail was based on the rank of farm movement. The trade union bureaucracy came in much later on that. And I think it's very important it's the way Julie talked about the parallels between the 1920s and today, because if I talk about the 1970s, the, first, the one thing that characterised it is confidence. The one thing we've got today is the lack of confidence, and that is the parallel. Lots of other differences, but I think I disagree with Julie when she said the problem of the minority movement in the 1920s was wrong politics. There's a fundamental issue about whether it would be possible to build a minority movement in that period, given the lack of confidence of workers in the factories. It's a point which. Chris Harmon made, which is a very important speech in 1984 to the SOP National Committee, reprinted in Socialist Review, where he argues quite specifically the issue around the minority movement in the 1920s wasn't that wrong politics, but you try to build an organisation where you link revolutionaries with reformists, by definition, people who are not part of the revolution, that's the broader, broader part of the movement. Those reformists cannot take action in their own shop, so they look to the trade union bureaucracy. They don't have an alternative. They're not shop stewards, and they can't pull out their own shop, therefore they lose the trade, look to the trade union bureaucracy. And the process of building the rank and file movement in that inevitably, because of objective situations, dra 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 drew people towards the trade union bureaucracy. That's a, a point which Harman made, but I think it actually has quite a lot of relevance. It's one of the challenges we have today is we know, I, mean, I work in the public sector, I know the anger in the public sector, the, I, get, I had a meeting, a shop meeting today, absolutely angry. Can we do anything about it? Can, you know, complaints about the trade union bureaucracy, but no ability to act independently of it. And the problem is, you know, when we have things like United Resistance, the dependence of having trade union bureaucrats on the platform is because we actually don't have the ability to, to operate independently of that. So I think we need to go back and look what do we actually mean by a rank and farm within a period without a lack of confidence? Is Julie right it's wrong politics, or was Chris Harmon right it's actually not objectively possible to build one in this period? See, I think part, part of the argument at present is about the, the state of play of, of, of workers' own, own confidence and their ability to shape activities. And I think if we run up, if we talk through the run up to the strikes in 2011, right, so the mass strikes in two, by the end of 2011, I don't believe it was simply a passive process, right, stuff that was handed down by the officials. I'm far from claiming, by the way, that there was some kind of mass rank and file activity by right, stuff forcing the officials to move. But actually, there was a process that went on through 2011, which was layers of the left officials, but also layers of socialist activists, whatever right, stuff, actually won an argument inside some of the smaller unions and brought them into battle. Right, and, stuff. and that was used really as a bludgeon to push the bigger unions, the, the affiliated unions with Labour, into, uh, into activity. Now, the big problem for us in many ways, right, so the bays, when the big break came, right, right, so in, in, in December to, to, in December to 2011, the force on the ground wasn't enough to put it back. But let's also look at what happened. There wasn't an immediate collapse. Actually, there was a long argument, right, so there were strikes in London, in the colleges, in the schools. There were strikes, were quite weak strikes in United Health Service and stuff, but actually from PCS members on college, on college workers in May that year. There was a fight right through the year into June, right, so in, in, into, in, into the Eastern stuff, into the teachers' conference, right, stuff like over. And actually, although again, I'm not claiming at all that you've got mass rank and violent relation amongst the teachers, actually, the huge meetings that have gone on around the country have played a role in pushing the NUT and the NHUWT back in, 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 into action. Also, obviously, at the same time, as the pressure that's coming down on those unions and the officials, if you're a teacher at the minute, your conditions are being, are being slashed to pieces. Just two, two other real, real quick things. One is, obviously, you know, when you use historical 
um, examples, it's always, it's always a difficult thing. Because our, our examples at the minute are complicated. This thing came over the last couple of weeks, the People's Assemblies. Right, so the People's Assembly had was a 4,000 strong meeting. There were big meetings across the country, right? So within that, we've got stuff about it. We want to be part of that milieu of people who are coming together and want to see a fight against, against, or, 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 against, against austerity, uh, austerity and the rest of it. Actually, some of these arguments were played out in the final session, I think, at, at the People's uh, at Assembly, where there was one speech which said strikes and demonstrations are just the same. One speech, which was which was Lemon Cluster, which said, name the day, I'll, I'll, let, I'll leave it to someone else to name the day, and Mark Sawatko then came in and said, well, wouldn't it be bloody helpful if we did it? But also within that, there is clearly a minority of thousands of activists who've been through a process over, over the last year, which, which is what we've tried to reach out with around UTR. We can bring those people together, right, so alongside the, the, the officials who express the anger the clearest, right, stuff, so and we want to try and create a space within that, we can stop trying to build a fight, a, a fighting minority within it. So I think the historical examples are good, but we have to be careful about the historical examples. There's a lot to talk about flexibility over the last period. We have to be ultimately flexible about the forms of organisation that begin, begin to develop. Within that, we are trying to find that layer of people, even in a small way, we begin, to, we begin to use grammar file self-activity. Um. I'm just on the historical thing. I mean, you know, how, how is it that you could get Harry Pollock or JT Murphy, revolutionaries who understood in a most sophisticated way the nature of the changing bureaucracy, who didn't have illusions and who pioneered the theory of independent rank and file organisation? How can you have those people within the space of just a few years ending up calling for all power to the TUC? You know, what's the explanation for it? And I think, you know, partly there is objective condition. I don't remember Harman's article actually, but I mean I think you know yes, there is there is there was a problem, there was the retreat, and in a sense that's why the minority group I think fitted the situation perfectly, which is why I think the United the resist resistance to it. It was a recognition that you couldn't build independent magnified organisation that formed the shop stewards movement, which had previously had, as Julie said that had been depleted by mass unemployment and so on. The revolutionaries are thrown back onto union structures, so it's finding a mechanism that can try to encourage rank and file organisation and activity, but recognising that you can work in collaboration with left officials and have a dynamic interaction between them without relying on them, but trying to utilise and put some pressure on them and galvanise it as a way of trying to stimulate rank and file activity. I think the, the conception of it was absolutely correct, and there are some historical lessons that we can draw. The dilemma, the problem was politics, though, because it wasn't just that the emphasis was wrong because of different of economic conditions. It seems to me the dimension which Julie mentioned, which I think really is emphasising far more, was Moscow. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the British Communist Party was, by this time, very fantastic under the influence of Moscow and, and you know, the, the growing sort of Stalinist uh, impact there. And the attempt to woo the British trade union leaders of the TUC, Tomsky, the leader of the Russian TUC, addressed the, the Congress. Swales and Hicks and, and Purcell and so on were viewed as being sympathetic to the, to the Soviet Union. There was everything being done in Bolshevik Russia, in, in Russia at the time to, to woo these trade union leaders, and that compromised the Communist Party's ability to take an independent attitude to the officials. On the one hand, they were right to have a form, a hybrid movement between the type of rank and file organisation which it had in the past and capitulate to the officials. I think the, the minority movement was perfect. But the emphasis was wrong, but the emphasis was wrong not primarily because of economic conditions, but because of wrong politics. And that was politics which came from above in terms of, the, of, of, of Moscow. Yeah, I'm from that bit, and uh, Michael's point. See, and the first question which I asked about uh, is enough historical memory, I think you can post it that way, in relation to uh, now to make minority movement happen. Well, first of all, the United Resistance is an attempt, in a new, albeit a, a new form, to try and actually replicate it, isn't it, in, in some sense. But I think it's just about historical memory as well. It's about, I think the key to it is understanding the nature and the character of the struggle itself. So I think what Michael said is very important, because if, I've read a few things recently, and I know uh, some people, I think, adhere to this in the room, and that is when they look to the student strikes, and they look to the November uh, strikes uh, last time around, they see them as simply bureaucratic mass strikes. This is completely wrong. This is such a wrong analysis, and I think hopefully we can get this out over the weekend. Because when you look to that strike, 
Then I was one of those Aussie Miss You. Um, you know, the first time we actually tried to get that sort of model for ground was actually in 2008. It was the teachers and the ourselves and the PCS who struck over pay. And I was in the National Executive then, I was out now. And it took a lot of work at the top, yes it did. But where did it come from? I know, see, people ask the question, why do you see you all the time, TB, Park, Strove, I tell you why. Partly because we've got a left, left executive, or did have a left executive, we don't have any more in the moment, at the moment. But it's not just that, that isn't the key reason of it. You look at the, the nature, it's actually a very well organised section, particularly in, in further education. Why? Actually, partly to the objective reasons. We got cut off from uh, local government, we therefore had a national bargaining for the last what, 12, 13 years and built a lot of strength, a lot of muscle at workplaces. I spend most of my time defending contracts, fighting local pay, things we don't want, but it's built up a level of struggle, in, a level of strength and organisation inside the workplace. And that's why. As it's meant when it came to the battles recently, when the left therefore reflected that kind of um, struggles and those kind of organisations starting to develop, it's not like a vast struggle. Usually it's connected together at a, a, official bodies at the regional level, but very much in touch with a uh, rank of organisation and so on. It is those bodies, those ideas, those expressions which people like ourselves built left networks up to then as you get the action on the ground. Yes, of course, we got it called at the bottom, then we had to fight to organise it. In fact, the first strike, I'll finish with the first strike, the 24th of, of March strike, which is you come out by ourselves on the pensions, we, we described it like this. Although we managed to get a call from above, to get the strike, actually to implement the bloody thing, because the officials didn't want to implement, the full timers didn't want to implement, it took the unofficial networks to get that strike off the ground. Now, of course, it's a combination thing. I think in unison, you perhaps could call it a little bit more a bureaucratic mass strike because they were forced, but even then, it would be too uh, unclear to say, to, 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 say, to say that. There's a much more, so when we talk about the nature and character of the struggle, when you see it in the way I've tried to describe it, a combination of networks, of beginnings of rank of organisations, or official regional networks, all these kinds of things, as well as the call from above, created the conditions for those struggles, then you can start to see how we can begin to build the kinds of organisations which can go further than simply to, uh, calling a one-day strike over pensions and start to act independently. If you don't get that, well, you, you can't even begin to start to get the thing, thing moving around any of the strikes at the moment. In fact, what you do is what you hear here is in some places here today. You collapse, you start to go making the face the open and then start uh, talking about what old scratches start walking out unofficially where you can't pull it. I uh, just want to say something about local government in Scotland. Uh, in our union, um, in the battle going on over pages now, um, that's a, following a, a, a rejection of a, a 1% offer and, and a, a postal ballot there which rejected that offer by 60 to, to 40. And I think with, with, with um, what's happening now, with, for example, the MPs pay rise, um, the, you know, the anger is just increasing. And as a result of that, what, what we're being balloted on is um, for, for two days of action across Scotland, along with five days of, of action in, in, in individual cities within Scotland. So it's, it's, um, for, certainly, in, for me, it's, it's, it's quite a, a big um, statement of what, of what the union thinks is appropriate. Um, which I think is a reflection of the anger. But just looking back at what's happened previously within Scotland, in 2010 we, we had a ballot as well over pay, and that was a postal ballot, and that rejected the, the offer too, but it was just a ballot on reject to accept. It wasn't a straight ballot. And what, the, what the union did was they, they called a kind of workplace or informal consultation, and that just, people were just confused by that with all the different options that were there, and it ended up to divisions within different workplaces as to exactly what all meant. And then of course what happened was they said, well we don't know what to do, we're not going to do anything and did nothing in 2010 over overpay. Um, and there's also the pensions dispute where then um, we, we know the sort of history of that. But the, the, the outcome of of that those two disputes it isn't pessimism or it isn't cynicism. It's it's a kind of sense that pe people still want to see action from from their union leaders, they look to their leaders if they hear something positive from um, an official. It raises the mood of everyone in the workplace, and they talk about it. Um, and I think things like the minority movement and unite the resistance. You know, I, I, we we might not feel that the bureaucracy fights. We know the bureaucracy doesn't fight, but. To many people, the beyond, it does sound as if the trade union leaders are fighting, and, and it's, if it sounds like that to people, then you know it's something that, that we should be involved with, and in order to raise the mood and the confidence of the members to go on and, and, and to win disputes.
Yeah, what I'd actually prepared up to talk about was dealt with much better than I could have done by a couple of speakers ago. But I did want to actually take on something that was said previously, which I just think sort of sums up part of the problem we face, which is our own internal pessimism about how we actually organise in the in the unions at the moment. See, to me it's true. Obviously we face major struggles in terms of trying to motivate workers and get enough workers to, to take action. But the idea is impossible. The idea that somehow all you face is, you know, people being angry but not being prepared to take action just doesn't fit the experience that I have. And I operate in the union in unison, which ought to be, in lots of ways, by the way, most people present it, one of the most bleakest uh, unions imaginable, because we have got a union bureaucracy that has, you know, was at the forefront of selling out the dispute in, in 2011. But see, I organise at two different levels in my, 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 my union. I operate as a band secretary in my workplace, right? And at the moment, I'm involved in quite a major campaign, which is a battle to bring our cleaners outsourced 20 or 30 years ago back in house. It's a campaign that we've been able to mobilise not just you know the Unison branch of that, we've recruited large numbers of what were largely un unorganised migrant workers into the unions on the basis of a campaign to fight. We've won Northern Wage back in 2008, and we're in the process of taking that to the next level. And actually, interestingly, about two weeks ago, we held an indicative ballot amongst was now probably the best step organised section of my workplace, and we got a 95% ballot with the bad uh, turnout, and we got a 98% vote to actually take slight action in October. But those workers and the uh, you know at, at, at the university doesn't concede on that. Now that isn't something which I think can be just easily uniformly um, generalised for, but it does show that it's not this desert that we talk about. The other thing I want to talk about is at the, 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 high, at the bigger level, if you like, about what happens across a union like the Unison. Because I organise in higher education, and we're in the higher education service as executive of the union. And for the second year in, in, in succession, the higher education service group executive in Unison has recommended the rejection of the pay deal, the rejection of the pay freeze, in the teeth of opposition from the National Union. And that's done because actually what a group of ordinary activists Right, who have actually exist in virtually every college up and down the country, have got together and have had the confidence to begin to organise in a way which isn't blank and filism, it's actually a level of union national committee, but we've managed to actually get ourselves together and organise across the, 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 the university and we now are able to actually kick back and fight. That's not the desert. Right? It still doesn't mean that we can do things independently of the bureaucracy. Of course, it comes back to the point that was made earlier about using the spaces that these people create is using the rhetoric of Dave Bettis when he smashes the ice sculpture about the pay freeze and says, actually, yes, we're going to try and deliver on that. You know, you have to try and have that relationship. But it, is, but it isn't the desert that was presented by one of the earlier contributions that actually nothing can be done because people are just too demoralised. It's actually, you know, we need to go beyond, obviously, the numbers of people that are actually organised in that way. But we've shown, I think, in a small way inside that session of unison, that that's perfectly possible, and therefore I do think we actually shouldn't have that level of pessimism. We should actually look at what we can do, both on the local and at the larger scale, but we should reject the idea that somehow there's a desert out there and there's nothing we can do. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm in uh, Oxford, SNP. Um, the, um, I just want to come back to the, uh, the point about um, the relationship between PA and the people assembling in United Resistance. I think it's important that we don't in a way that we see you know, potential for a bit of an opportunity there. Um, because, um, take an example, we had, we, we'd been, we'd only really started to, to and although we had big de delegations going down to United Resistance conferences from Oxford, we'd only really started to kind of really get it going as a, as a, as a real network quite recently, um, and, uh, with a with, you know, conference earlier, with the, with the kind of, a, you know, reasonably kind of, uh, kind of a, a meet up earlier, uh, earlier in the year. Um, and out of that, you know, we, we had a couple of people who who come round 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 with us, and one of those people kind of went to the People's Assembly uh, as a um, and went as a United Resistance delegate, and has now become central along with uh, you know myself to, to try and to get the People's Assembly off, off the ground in, um, where we are. Now he played a really useful role very recently because there's a uh, there's an FE college which is Oxford and Chowell Valley College which provides um, you know educate decent education for for lots of class student, uh, uh, you know, people in Oxford, you know, and that's been seriously attacked by the fact that the, the all the lecturer, the lecturers are having all their um, um, are, there's a, uh, are having their um, uh, kind of uh, there's a number of compulsory redundancies um, and, 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 and change to contract there. Um, so it's a major attack on not only I mean, on, on, on terms of contract on, uh, on, on their on their terms, but also on uh, on working class education in the city. I think there's an opportunity for using the, both both vehicles in a way. 
that the people in, in, within the within the within the people's assembly we can put wider arguments about about the um, about about education because we are bringing in more people. We had we had an organising meeting for people's assembly where we had at the very first one, which had been called on quite a short notice, we had over 50 people there from a lot of different campaigns. Since then, we've had large numbers of people writing into us because we had a, we had a leafleting campaign writing into us saying we want to get involved. I think there's a real opportunity to to to. To, to kind of reach out to the kind of people coming in to put pressure to put pressure um, to, to put to, to put uh, to put pressure over 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 the wide political issues, but then to take that in through United Resistance into into the kind of strategy that we're trying to build over over over, over networks. And the kind of final thing I want to say is that is that is that the, this this person who's been kind of helping uh, uh, in the uh, you know the uh, uh, kind of leading the kind of people's assembly stuff here uh, as a, through the kind of our you know, United Resistance thing. Uh, kind of got got in his Unison Health branch a motion passed with support for the uh, for the for the uh, for the people at OCBC. They had a, they had a, a picket where, where where over 50 people a sort of picket a demonstration where over 50 people came out. And there's a bit of a problem here, which is that which is that the big big show of um, um, kind of people wanting wanting to move, but then the but then the uh, branch secretary says, uh, but uh, right, well that's good, but unfortunately it's the summer, so we're going to close down. Uh, but 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 a real uh, but but when we showed this, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, but, when, but people, you know, we're really excited by seeing the, the thing, and, and there's an opening there. And I think we should be making sure that we're using both, you know, the opportunity provided by both strategies, but trying to make sure that we're not having kind of parallel strategies in the moment. I mean, this might not be the biggest meeting of Marxism, but I think it's one of the most important kind of debates, and I'm glad that we'll have and continue on the debate. I mean, I, I, there's a, I think there's a, a phrase, it's what it says, is the present is history, and in a sense that's true. Um, and there's a couple of points I want to make. I mean, I think Ralph, I, I wanted to come back and Pete, and the, 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 the thing that he mentioned about Chris Harmon, I, I think Ralph dealt with that. I think that um, even the Communist Party understood when they launched the minority movement, it wasn't a rank and file movement. Willie Gallagher, who actually was the chairman of the Clyde Workers Committee, um, and he knew about rank and file movements, made that quite clear. He said the minority movement is not a rank and file movement um, because, because of what JT Murphy had said, it would be impossible to build it. And therefore, if, if you thought that you were building, attempting to relaunch by volunteerism a rank and file movement in 1922 23, then you would have been mad and people would be right. But that wasn't what they were trying to do. They were trying to launch a hybrid that would lead, it was a stepping stone. A bridge towards a real rank and file movement, something like they had experienced in the in the, the, the period after 1915, and I think it's important to understand that. On the question of, of our history and, and the history of rank and file movements, there was a book written in 1975 by James Hinton, who'd written an earlier brilliant book in Shop Stewart's movement, and another guy called Richard Hyman, who at that time was still a member of the IS. And it was a book basically attacking, well, it was actually attacking the IS for trying to launch a, a, a rank and file movement in the 70s. But it was a failed attack because it was used to, it was an attack in the minority movement and the attempt of the Communist Party to build a combat organisation. And Hyman argued that was politically wrong to do that. They should have stopped to build an a cadre organisation. Duncan Harris, in his review of the book, and I think it's also in the pamphlet that Julie referred to, said the one thing about the Communist Party in 1924, 25, and 26, they made mistakes, but they weren't fucking irrelevant. They weren't irrelevant. And what he said was Hyman's argument was would have made us irrelevant and would have made them irrelevant. The, despite the mistakes they made, they were committed to trying to build in the struggle. And I think that's important to understand that. And I think that's a lesson for today. That we can't stand back and read the ruins. We have to be part and parcel of trying to rebuild the movement. And it's very difficult and there's a lack of confidence, but that's what we have to do. The second point was an earlier speaker said that it will get easier as the struggle rises to combat reformism because it will fade away. That is not the experience. It's certainly not the experience in 1924 to 26. It certainly wasn't the experience in 1919 when the reformists sold out the 40 year strike were stronger. Their arguments won through. They sabotaged. It wasn't the troops, Julie, that defeated the 1919 strike, although they were used. It was the trade union bureaucracy that did it. And that's something we have to realise as well. And in, I, I remember, like Pete, we went through the, 70, the, the, the period up to and including the 74 Labour government. It was reformism that broke the shops. It wasn't the Thatcher that broke the shops. You want that comment, please. Jones and Scanlon, who were the terrible left twins, sold us the social contract. 
And that was the ruination of the movement that had brought in the Tory government. It was reformism, illusions in reformism, at a very high period of struggle. High period of struggle doesn't mean people lose their illusions in reformism. They can be strengthened because people on the right move to the left and they don't move to the international <coughs> socialists as it was at the time, or revolutionary politics automatically, they all move to left reformism. Okay. I just wanted to talk about this issue about a lack of confidence and no organisation. Just give a quick example about this quite a complicated issue. So in Camden, uh, we had an unorganised group of outsourced workers, parking wardens, no union organisation. It took three years to recruit most of them, get recognition. It took another year to organise strike action. It then, strike action was successful. And then we had the problem about dealing with the regional union bureaucracy, which hate action. And then we had to use the national organised, national union bureaucracy against the regional bureaucracy in order to move it forward. And then we had to use some unusual ways, getting the entire workforce um, 180 odd to sign a petition complaining about the behaviour of the regional convener and then enlisting the support or knowledge of the general secretary and so on. Now, the upshot is we didn't achieve what could have been achieved, but we achieved wage increase. We've got a shop stewards committee and the majority of the people there are black and ethnic minorities. And they know that they're organised, they've got the Stewards Committee, the management have to meet them. And it's all done in the last three years. Now, about a month ago, another outsourced group in another London borough said, we're going on strike, we want to make sure that none of the NSL contractors or companies are going to blackleg, you know, so, or, you know, going to strike break. So we've said to people, if you get an offer to work, I think it's an evening, don't go. So we're now trying to get a London-wide attack on the company on organising everywhere in London. And this can be done, and so it's possible to do it. Even now, it's going to be difficult. But you have to bit of ingenuity, you have to have persistence, and it can be done. And as a party, as a kind of labour group, we actually have to look out in the future, how we respond and we prepare for it. I'll give you two examples of preparation. It does look like London schools in the inner London are going to get hammered after the, you know, the recent budget. And that's going to be quite serious. I really think we now, we now I'm assuming NUT, are thinking about you know, what they do. The other area in my council is agile working. Now, this may be total gobbledygook for most people here. I'll tell you what it means. Do you want to Yeah, it means no PCs, you get a notebook, you carry your notebook around, a whole series of health and safety issues which arise, and around the health and safety issues, we can organise and recruit. Lastly? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the um, um, minority movement, really, because I wasn't convinced by I didn't really agree with what the comrade said earlier that the national minority movement was doomed to defeat from the outset, because I, because I really think that um, the time it was formed was not actually at the depths of the, the, the retreat, it was actually when the struggle started to, to pick up again in 19, 1924, there was a Labour government elected, which was, it was a minority government, it lasted a few months, but it was an enormous boost for workers' confidence at the time, even though it was a complete, complete flop, and it did, did I mean, the, the depth of the downturn was the engineering lockout in 1922, and that was engineering where the, um, the rank and file movement was the strongest. And the lockout really killed that off completely. But the national minority movement was formed when things were beginning to pick up again. And there was, you know, there was a, for instance, there was an unofficial dock strike in 1924. There was a bus strike. There were real signs of the, the, the struggle was picking up, which is why the Communist Party took, took, the, took the initiative to do it. And I think it did, did fit 
in, in the period. I mean, I think Julie went through the, the fact that the scale of the conferences, the level of, it had, you know, it was a very influential or, or, or organisation. And I think you even saw that with, with the general strike. And the general strike <coughs> for nine days. I mean, a bit, but the, the, the biggest number of workers on strike was after the strike was called off. And in certain areas where there was the rank and file organisation, you know, it was in, in Newcastle and Battersea, the trades councils in those areas had complete control of what was going on. Nothing moved in those areas without the signed permission of, of the trades council. Uh, you know, tragically, that, because of the failures of the Communist Party, that, 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 that wasn't generalised and it was, it was too little too late. And I think the failure of the national minority movement was it was transformed from being a, a, an organisation to bring militants together, to encourage struggle, to pressure the officials, to, to cheerleaders for the TUC. So it is a political failure. It's clearly related to the degeneration of the Communist International and, the, and, the, and the, the bureaucracy deciding they want to build influence with the TUC to end Russia's isolation and the, building the Communist Party and the workers of Britain's interests came you know, we're, we're, we're abandoned. And that's what we need to learn the lessons for today. It's the, it's the politics of it. We can shift the bureaucracy. We've had examples mentioned already, uh, but I think we need to learn the lessons of this period to decide how we can do it. Yeah, cool. I'm obviously going to have time to come back on everything, but just to come back on uh, some of the points. Um, I think it was useful to raise the question about, you know, is it what you, you, know, you can't, the idea that you can't build rank and file movements just in any period and that it depends on the kind of, you know, the levels of struggle, the levels of confidence, I completely agree with that point, but I do agree with the speaker who, you know, I was going to take up the point about, you know, the minority movement wasn't wasn't a rank and file movement in that sense, um, and, you know, what it was was more, more of a hybrid, um, where, you know, it was involving the left officials, where you were trying to use a relationship with them to create the space where you can, you know, begin to network among the rank and file and, and have, rank, you know, rank and file activity in, inside the unions where you can start to try and use that as a process to rebuild. That's quite different from, you know, rank and file movement, I think, which is something that, you, you know, depends on the confidence and, and levels of organisation and things among workers. Um, and I can, I, you know, I don't, I don't really think that they, they had very much choice faced with the period that they were in. Um, you know, I, I agree that it, wouldn't, it would have been wrong to try and launch a rank and file movement in that period. Um, and I think that what it was was really it was the it was the political failure of the Communist Party to be able to lead that was the main the main lesson I think from that period. Um there's another few points. Yeah, I mean I think the meetings obviously the lessons of the minority movement for today and I didn't spend very much time at the beginning talking about today so I wanted to, to touch upon some of that now and I think you know if you look at what we can say about the general picture at the moment, you look at um, something like Thatcher's death, I think showed something that's quite crucial um, in the current situation, really, which is that you know it showed up this existence of a, of a kind of grown bitter class anger um, that's you know taken hold in, in working class communities across the country. One of the things I thought was really interesting and shows the kind of the, the, the high level of, of politics of the period and, and you know the, this high level, you know, the sense that it's a class attack was the was the number of young people that actually, if you look through some of the YouTube, I didn't get to go on it, but if you look through some of the YouTube videos of people who tried to go and protest at Thatcher's funeral and were out in the streets of London, there's loads and loads of young people, like young workers there, there was some young workers there, um, young students and things that were there, people who weren't obviously alive, um, you know, during, uh, during Thatcher's time but who identified that what was going on now and what they could see with the attack on education, the attack on the health service, um, you know, the bedroom tax, all these kind of things were, were really you know, part of that same agenda um, and part of a continuation of, of Thatcher's legacy, really, where you had a government that was trying to force, uh, force workers to pay for, for the crisis. Um, and I think you've seen that kind of that high level of politics as well, and that, that 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 class anger coming out through stuff like the bedroom tax campaigns, which I think there's some people here in the room from the ones in uh, in, uh, in Glasgow, um, which have just been you know fantastic <laughs> fantastic resistance that you've seen. I mean, people if they haven't seen it, you should take round and show the the centre of the, the local paper where you're all in there burning the burning the eviction letters. It's a fantastic story that people should should hear, and this is seeing you know people who haven't been you know politically active in things or is that you know the first time that they've been on a demo or so and come you know being thrust into activity often often working class women you know like uh, like Marion who, who led off at the opening rally You've seen a similar thing in the NHS you know with the, the, the cap these mass cap huge campaigns to defend hospitals where you know you've seen mobilizations that I think have been the biggest in any community since the you know since the onset of the crisis this is um, all this and the and the people's assembly you know the biggest Biggest event of its kind, 4,000, 4, 4, 4,500 people out there coming because they, you know, they heard about it. They want to come and discuss an alternative to, to um, austerity. This is this is all a reflection, I think, of the of the kind of 
the, the, the high level of politics and the mood that we're, we're existing in at the moment. But there's something else going on as well, I think, at the moment um, beyond that, which means that really, you know, what the People's Assembly was wasn't quite, wasn't quite enough, I think, to address the, the current mood. Um, and I think we, it's right to say that we have to be flexible on these things. We have to keep looking to see what the, you know, what the mood is, what, you know, how, how we can judge it. But I think at the moment what you see is, if you look at the pensions dispute, um, you know, the fact that last year the, the payments started coming out of people's actual wage packets and so on, in some senses you could say that was a defeat because you know, the, the attack's gone through, it's starting to come out now. Um, but actually it hasn't, I don't think, been widely interpreted by a defeat. Um, you know, it isn't the case. I think that most workers are looking around at the, you know, the union um, leaders and seeing them as these, you know, they've been massively betrayed by them and anything. People, I don't think, are perceiving things in that way. I don't think there's that, that level of demoralisation about the current mood. People actually still look to the union leaders, I think, for a lead in many senses. But there's also a significant minority, I think, that you can trace through you know, well, the, the clearest one is in the, in the Hicks vote, we get 36% of the vote to the left of what's a quite left wing, uh, on the face of it, un, union uh, leader. Um, but you can see it through every union conference, you can see it in the NUT where you've got a third of the conference voting against the executive, you can see it in the, the EIS where despite the fact that, you know, prominent, mem prominent members of the bureaucracy in the union oppose the motion for affiliation to unite the resistance, actually you get an argument on the floor and that coming through and getting passed, which is... Quite, quite interesting, I think, in the, in the current period that something like that would happen. But you can see that thread right through, I think, um, where there's, there's those people who, it's not just about wanting to see the alternatives, um, an alternative to austerity, which I think a lot of people are looking for, but actually you've got a layer of people who, you know, in, within the organised sections of the unions, the, you know, activists who actually want to go beyond what the union leaders are, are offering at the moment, who want to, you know, who are critical of the, of the of the pace of the union leaders and who want to see more. And I think we have to have we have to have a mechanism in a period where confidence isn't at the, at the scale where we can have a rank and file movement, where we can try and relate to that, that mood of people as well. And this is something that I think is not, you know, in isolation. Of course we have to be absolutely involved in all those um, developments like the People's Assembly, like the bedroom tax campaigns, like the, the NHS demonstrations and every expression I think of people wanting to see an alternative. Um, and I think, I suppose to end really, I think somebody, the question came up about is there a memory, um, you know, is there still going to be a memory for the, the struggles that we've seen to, you know, make way for the new struggles to come through and I think part of what, what that is really is, that's what, you know, people talk about the, the idea of a revolutionary party being the memory of, of, the, of the class, memory of the working class that you can you know, gather up all these experiences and analyse them and go through them and sit in meetings like this and have arguments about what lessons you could draw from them and what the best way to, to try and apply and learn from them. This is what a revolutionary party is about, really. So I think if there's anybody in the room who's not a member of the SWP, um, you know, this is absolutely what we're about and I think people should think about joining. Cheers.